Hello everyone, uh, I'm Shreyam and I welcome you all to the first part of the Avahan online lecture series. This is an initiative by Avahan to uh, recognize distinguished and extraordinary work taking the place in the field of sports and highlight uh, its impact in the student community of India. Uh, today's lecture will be delivered by Reid McElroy Young. Uh, he's a computer science PhD student at the University of Toronto and he's studying computational social science where uh, he attempts to answer social questions by applying machine learning. Uh, his today's talk will focus on his recent work, uh, the Maya Chess Engine. Uh, Reed is the lead researcher of Maya, uh, a deep learning framework that learns from online human games instead of self-play. Uh, Maya tries to predict and replicate the human move played in any position at different skill levels instead of solving chess as previous engine developers have attempted to. Um, during the session, if you feel that uh, you have any questions, uh, you feel free to unmute and ask the speaker directly. You may also put your questions in the Zoom chat. Uh, to the Facebook viewers uh, who are watching it through Avahan's live Facebook page, can uh, drop their uh, drop their questions in the comment section, and we'll relay it uh, in uh, relay to read. Uh, we'll be having a 15-minute uh, Q&A session at the end of the talk. Uh, also, uh, if you we request you, unless you don't have a pressing question, kindly keep yourself uh, muted to not to disturb uh, uh, the speaker. Uh, handing it over to read. There we go. Yeah, thank you, Fran. Um, yeah, that's a wonderful introduction. Um, but yeah, no, I'm, I've got the, the chat open in another window, so I will try and pay attention a little bit like that. And uh, I, I like having some sort of interaction with the with the people who are watching the talk and stuff. So um, if I see questions, I'll try and answer them live instead of just doing them all at the end. Um, but uh, with that, I'm just going to get going. Um, yeah, so this is uh, what we call Maya Chess. So this is uh, work by me. I'm a PhD student at the University of Toronto. Uh, my advisor, Dr. Ashton Anderson, also at the University of Toronto. And then there's also Siddhartha Sen, who's a researcher at Microsoft Research, and John Kleinberg, who is at Cornell. Um, so uh, first of all, let's sort of talk about why we're really interested in AI and chess. And this sort of has this long history. So uh, Alan Turing, who's one of the people who's sort of foundational to uh, computer science as a discipline, was thinking about playing chess even before he had a computer to play it on. Uh, then there's Claude Shannon, who's one of the originators of uh, information theory and did a lot of fundamental work in uh, defining what, 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 what terms we use in AI, basically the predecessor to AI research. And he came up with the Minimax in chess, which is this algorithm that's now used in uh, the state of the art chess engines like uh, Stockfish and in a whole bunch of other machine learning techniques. And then a little bit further on, we have John McCarthy, who's one of the original AI researchers. He's uh, the person who came with Lisp. And he has this quotation chess is the Drosophila of artificial intelligence, uh, which uh, directly inspired my advisor, Ashton, to do some of his research. Uh, so Drosophila is a reference to the uh, fruit fly in uh, biology, which is this model organism. It's, uh, they're cheap to take care of, you just need to put out rotting fruit. Uh, they're very well understood, they're easy to handle, and so they've become sort of the de facto standard for if you're doing biological research, here's something you can use that is, uh, doesn't require any upkeep or management compared to rats or actually doing real human lab experiments. And chess has a lot of these properties as well. Uh, so as computational social scientists, we're sort of interested in understanding humans. So if we have the small model system, it's useful. Um, and then getting more into contemporary uh, computer science, of course, there's this interesting uh, result of Deep Blue defeating Kasparov in 97, which to many is sort of the marker of AI sort of beating humans. And this is, Chess again is sort of at the forefront of this, as it's one of the as this is, in many ways, the first sort of ex hard example of uh, AI's definitively and strongly beating humans. And since about uh, 2005 or so, uh, high-level chess play, there's been no there's been no beat there's been no humans who have beaten uh, chess player uh, chess engines, um, and contemporarily, like on my laptop, I could. 
running stockfish beat basically, uh, it'd be basically impossible for a human to beat it. Um, and then we get to, in 2017, uh, Alpha Zero, which defeated Stockfish. So Stockfish was, uh, at the time, the top engine. Um, and Alpha Zero did it in this interesting way where they used this uh, neural network-based uh, approach that actually were work, our work is sort of directly inspired by. And uh, it did something called self-play using reinforcement learning. So it never actually saw chess, it just sort of it never saw humans playing chess. It just sort of got the rules of the game and was informed and pushed towards those. Um, and so now we have these, what we call like superhuman chess engines. So these are very powerful. They're very good at playing chess. They're much better than you or I, but I'm a very bad chess player. Um, so I am trying to learn from chess engines and try and get better. How do I use these? Uh, incredibly powerful devices? And the answer is, there isn't really that good of a way. So if I just take this position and I ask the chess engine what to do, it will give me lots of answers, it will give me lots of details, but it doesn't really give me any way of understanding. And even when it gives me answers, I don't even know if they're necessarily that good. So one of the answers here is a pawn move that is sort of understandable, where you put pressure on the other pawn, but the third one down, which is uh, H5, is not really one that makes sense to me as a human. It's just moving a random pawn far away from the action. And the chess engine doesn't really have a way of distinguishing between these moves that make sense to humans and the ones that don't. So it's not that useful for uh, humans trying to learn. Um, and then additionally, if you try and go the other way, so we have these chess engines that are superhuman, but humans still want to play chess, um, so you can play a game with them. So here's a game my advisor was uh, playing against, uh, Stockfish. It had been set to level four, so that's a rating of around uh, 1400. So it's not supposed to win that much uh, against a, a moderately skilled uh, chess player. And so it's tried to, it sort of initiated this trade. Um, and so, uh, we take you take the the, the knight, and now uh, basically every human would just finish this trade. But instead, the engine just again does sort of a random move. In this case, it's actually sort of the opposite reason. Uh, this is likely due to the uh, engine sort of intentionally making a mistake um, as a way of basically giving the human a chance. So the engine knows that if you play it at full strength indefinitely, it's just going to win. So if the engine thinks it's getting too far ahead, it basically makes mistakes until you're uh, you're having a close and narrow game, which it doesn't even know what a good mistake is. So it sort of isn't even very good at faking those mistakes. Um, so then we get to the sort of more general research question, which is then we have these artificial intelligences that are superhuman or even just uh, very different from humans intelligence and we understand how to bring them closer together so in chess people have been working on this for a long time um, but as we saw we're not that good now there are a couple better examples in stockfish but still it's uh, very much a work in progress despite having decades of uh, research and energy and additionally uh, Chess is sort of at the forefront of this. There's lots of examples in uh, sort of contemporary AI research where we sort of expect in the near future these to become more and more common issues. So self-driving cars is sort of the classic example. Uh, they're five years from uh, being in every home, which they've been five years from being in every home for the last 20 years, but uh, this time they'll, they'll get there. Um, and the systems that are being used on self-driving cars right now are not really understandable to humans. We basically just run it on the roads for 10,000 hours and hope it doesn't kill anyone. We don't have any way of act, asking it uh, why it chose to slightly accelerate or slightly decelerate or put the, hit the brake hard when it saw a stop sign. Um, or there's, uh, in medical research, there's a bunch of work going on right now in sort of having these uh, AI systems that act as doctors, so they observe 
a picture of a cancer, and I, they're, they theoretically are doing better than humans on certain tasks, but if it's going to come down to some sort of surgical intervention, do you really want to just trust one of these AI systems? Uh, we need some way of having humans that can interact with these uh, AI systems and get some insights that other humans can trust and understand. Um, so we want, we are proposing in this work, in, in the paper we submitted, uh, that chess is actually a very good system for understanding this because we have these superhuman uh, engines. And then we also have some other useful properties. So chess, uh, we have uh, chess servers that have been online for decades. So we have huge amounts of games of chess being played between humans. Um, in our work, we're using Wii Chess, which is uh, a very popular and open uh, chess server. I'll talk a little bit more about them later. Um, additionally, in chess, we have uh, this rating. Uh, the ratings are usually called LO. Uh, they're based on this original algorithm that uh, LO devised. And so it lets you classify uh, players and by product their moves and their actions as being high or low skill, which is very useful if you're trying to understand, is this artificial intelligence acting like a human? And as you can say, is it behaving like a high skill or a low skill human? Um, and so then our sort of first task was, how can we algorithmically capture human style in chess? So can we take uh, some computer program and try and make it behave like a human? as that sort of suggests we have a better understanding of how humans interact with chess. And then the one of the first questions that comes up with this is what do we mean by behaving like a human? So for this work, we define that to be predicting the next move a human at a specific skill level will make in a real game. So we have to sort of discretize this task and make it something that is doable. So to do that, we uh, took a bunch of data uh, from Lee Chess, I said this is a wonderful uh, free and open chess server. Uh, they're approaching two billion games, um, and they have some very nice practices and stuff. Uh, we've uh, since publishing the work have worked with them, and they're uh, very wonderful people. Um, and so, before I sort of go more into discussion of this, I just want to sort of uh, talk about. Uh, these sort of neural network architectures. Um, as we're just going to sort of start zooming through uh, Lila Chess and Maya. And so uh, Alpha Zero came out. It was a published paper. And uh, it was by Google, though. And they didn't actually publish the source code or any sort of like way you could run Alpha Zero. Um, they did publish lots of explanations of how it worked. So here's an example. Um, and there's this project called Lila Chess that has taken over the mantle, and they are an open source implementation of it. So you have this uh, large neural network uh, that takes in basically the chess boards as an image, um, and it takes in uh, the current chess board and, a large, and about eight of the previous ones, and then runs it through a huge number of matrices, and at the very end sort of outputs a couple of numbers suggesting the move and the probability that you'll win. Um, and so that led to Leela. Uh, then there's also uh, Stockfish, which is a more traditional uh, chess engine. It's sort of uh, Leela and Stockfish, sort of uh, depending on who you ask and uh, what versions are on, one or the other usually is the strongest chess engine. Uh, Stockfish is a much more traditional one that uses uh, Minimax search. Um, Although, interestingly, the most recent version of Stockfish has actually introduced a small neural network uh, to improve performance. So they're all sort of converging on the same sort of neural network uh, design. Um, and as we saw, you can take Stockfish and you can make it make errors until it plays at a rating level. Uh, so basically, it'll win 50% of the time against players with the target rating. And the way you do that is you limit how much computational power it has. Um, so Stockfish does this minimax search. And by reducing how far into the future it can search, uh, you reduce its, its skill level. Leela also does a sort of tree search, but uh, it uses a much more complicated neural network model. So even with almost no search, 
it is still very powerful. So to make uh, weaker versions of Leela, uh, what we did is during its training process, so it does self-play to learn how to play chess, we uh, took Leela at different generations of that. So basically, we took some very early ones that were just learning to play chess, and then we sampled throughout uh, its training process uh, more and more powerful versions of it. Um, and then, uh, so we already sort of know that these attenuated engines, they match sort of aggregate game reference. So we can take uh, one of our versions of Leela and sort of uh, make it and say, oh, we put this on uh, Lee Chess and it got this rating. So we have this sort of aggregate uh, performance. But as I said, we're trying to get this granular human decision making. So instead of going at just the rating level, uh, we get the move level. Um, uh, and then to be, as we said, we are trying to be very, uh, we're, si we're scientists about this, so we need to very discreetly define what we're measuring and what we're doing. So, uh, to that, we uh, took the game from 2000, uh, from 2019 in December, from the chess. Uh, we looked only at games that were faster than one minute, so that on Lee Chess, that's, uh, it's called Blitz, is the time control, and then so we only look at Blitz and faster games. And then for these games, we we looked at ones where both players were within similar ratings. We divided all the ratings into these 100-point uh, ranges. So there's a bin for 1,100 to 1,199, and then 1,200 to 1,299 is another bin. And so we create these bins. Uh, we look between 1,100 and 1,900, and we selected 10,000 games just randomly from those bins, and we made that into our set. So we have 90,000 games, and then for each of those games, what we say is we look at the percentage of the positions in those games that the model uh, matches the moves. So we're sort of averaging over the games, and then we're we're averaging over the positions in the games, and then we are averaging over the uh, games themselves. It's sort of a way of normalizing for the length of the games, because if a game goes to 200 or 300 moves, it doesn't really, it's not really that interesting how accurate you are uh, in the 150th move. Uh, and that sort of would bias our data set, so we're trying to normalize for that. Also, in our analysis, we removed uh, the first uh, five moves by each player, so the first 10 ply, uh, basically because we're not really that interested in the opening strategies and matching those. We're much more interested in sort of understanding the uh, mid-game and late-game behavior. Um, so what we want to see, or so what we're going to do is we're going to take them and we're going to plot them like this. So on the x-axis on the bottom, uh, we have the rating. And then on the y-axis, we have the move matching accuracy. And what we're going to want to see is something like this. So if we sort of think about this naively, we might think we just want to see a, a horizontal line uh, that's high up. But we know sort of analytically that it doesn't really make sense to have the same accuracy uh, throughout this plot, or throughout the x-axis, because by definition, uh, 1,100 rated players and uh, 1,900 rated players play quite differently. So instead, we want some sort of specificity. We want to be able to target a specific rating. And we sort of assume uh, that players of similar ratings are going to play similarly. So we're expecting a sort of Gaussian sort of distribution uh, over it. And then we want some sort of way of parameterizing our model or selecting different models or different attenuation strategies so that we can have a series of models that work throughout the different ratings. Um, and so when we did this with Stockfish, so this is the first one we think of, um, we uh, basically are limiting the depth at which Stockfish can uh, play. Um, and we see it does okay. Uh, on a high skill player, Stockfish is moderately accurate. It's uh, about 41% at the very top. But at low skills, it's much lower. It's uh, 
36%, uh, 37%. Um, and additionally, we don't have any of this fine tuning uh, behavior we wanted. We can't say this stockfish is, we can't say if we attenuate stockfish in this way, it plays more like an 1100 player because that version will play better. We'll just it's play more video. like a book. Um, so yeah, we, and so it's okay. Um, there is actually one sort of other interesting result we got though. Uh, if you can, it might be hard to see over the video call, uh, but stockfish at depth one is actually stronger than uh, stockfish at depth five. So stronger in this case means at predicting the next move we will make. And then what gets, what's interesting is that it actually reverses. So Basically, the very initial like uh, first sort of gut instinct of stockfish is more human than stockfish thinking for a little bit. But if you let it think for a lot longer, up to around depth 13, uh, definitely onto depth 15, uh, it gets better. It's still better at predicting the next move you will make. So there is some sort of interesting uh, complexity to how stockfish is matching humans. Um, then we went on to Leela. So Leela is uh, based on Alpha Zero. It's doing this self play. This uh, self play. So it's never even actually, in theory, it's never interacted with or has any understanding or intuitions from humans in its way of playing. But as you can see here, it is uh, noticeably more human uh, than Stockfish. And this is what uh, people were saying when Leela came out. Also, is that it felt more human. Um, and we, we see this in our results, so it's more accurate across the board. And in particular, it's more accurate at predicting uh, low skill players. Unfortunately, again, we don't get this sort of tunability. Um, and we, we get very much this like strict uh, sorting. So the best Leela for predicting uh, what players, what moves players will make is just the strongest one. So this is sort of a a boring result, and it means uh, it's still very difficult to like say this one plays more human-like. Um, so now we uh, get to our results, our uh, work, which we called Maya. Uh, just looking in the chat, no, uh, Maya is not an acronym. Uh, it's actually uh, named after uh, a Russian uh, female chess player. Um, we it was a chess player who had AI in their name was the uh, actual reason we picked it. So um, yeah, so this is based on Leela and Stockfish to another extent. And we very much explicitly came in with this goal of learning to play uh, like a human and specifically learning to play from humans. Um, so the model we chose is this sort of uh, convolutional, re convolutional ResNet. Um, it outputs two things actually. So it outputs the policy, which is sort of the next move, and it also outputs the value. So it also tries to predict uh, the probability the current player will win. But we don't really talk about that much in our work as we're more interested in the moves. Um, and then just to make it more explicit, because we're very much directly comparing to Leela. Um, and so Leela does a very good job at trying to play uh, like to play well. So we're not trying to say it's a uh, faulty at all. Um, and one of the sort of interesting uh, results uh, that we found when trying to come up with these models is we phrase it as a classification task instead of the reinforcement learning task. Um, so uh, Leela and uh, Alpha Zero, they have this thing called a UCT uh, search, um, which is uh, based on the Monte Carlo tree search. Um, and that sort of lets them, uh, by spending more computing time, uh, get stronger and uh, make better predictions. Uh, we did some split exploration of that. I'll uh, show about. I'll I have a plot on that later. Uh, but basically, uh, by doing it as a pure classification task, which in machine learning is sort of a simpler task, we actually were able to get uh, better accuracy. Um, and then, so our model is trying to output. Uh, what the next move a human will make, and then the probability of a human winning from that position. Whereas Leela is trying to output the optimal move and the probability of winning conditioned on this optimal play. 
Um, and so uh, instead of parameterizing by the length of training for the Mayas, we parameterized by the targeting in the input data that the model got. So we, we have uh, nine models who so Maya 1100 is trained on people who are rated 1100 on Lee Chess. My 1200 is trained on people who are rated 1200 on Lee Chess. And so for each of these models, we took uh, 12 million games uh, from, from Lee Chess. And that's why we, uh, when we initially defined our data set, we limited it to uh, December of 2019. So the Maya models are trained only on games before that, are trained only on games from before December of 2019. So we know the models don't know anything about the test data that we're going to use. Um, and then we get this sort of wonderful result. So you can see here, first of all, uh, our, our y-axis is higher. We're much more accurate. The worst we're getting is 46%. Uh, and the highest we get is above 50%, even at the very low skill players. And then we also are getting this wonderful uh, tunability. Uh, so you can see here on the left, uh, the Maya that's targeted on 1100 is the strongest for playing 1100, whereas the Maya, the Maya model on 1900 is the best for predicting 1900. And that goes uh, basically a whole, along the whole line. So we have now tunability. Um, and if we want to compare that to the other ones, so just put it on the same plot, you can see um, we're noticeably ahead of them. Um, and we have, uh, we, even, we even extended this out into all the way up to 2,500 rating and our strong models still continue to perform well. And uh, in many ways, we're happy that the weaker models are getting worse. So that sort of suggests that they're less, they're, they're actually are playing uh, like the players were targeting. And you see that Stockfish continues to do very well. Um, and then of note, of course, that uh, Maya 1900 is well above Stockfish on this shot, but it doesn't mean Maya 1900 would beat Stockfish. Stockfish will very easily uh, beat Maya 1900. Um, this is just looking at the prediction accuracy. Um, and we'll get into a little bit later, but we have these chess plots on Lee Chess. So we actually are starting to be able to put and figure out exactly the ratings of our different models. Um, and then another way of looking at this is not how much do they agree with uh, other players, with the humans, but how much do they agree with each other? Because there's an interesting thing that happens is that our Maya models all agree with each other quite a bit, significantly more than they agree with other human, with humans. And this is in some ways a bit unexpected because our models uh, are trained entirely on different games. So there's no sharing of data between them. Uh, so this sort of suggests that they're sort of picking up on some fundamental patterns and they're not just sort of learning some like random distribution that is sort of similar to the thing they're looking at. There's actually sort of more fundamental agreement. So even if the models predict and move wrong, they might actually have some reason for doing that beyond just sort of computers being weird. Um, and then you also see even they have relatively good agreement with uh, Stockfish and Leela, which uh, sometimes struggle to agree even with themselves at weaker versions. Um, so you can see just how powerful the tree search in Stockfish is. It makes it much, it makes it, it pulls it quite far away from its starting point. Um, and then, as I said, uh, our models are just working as classification engines. Um, so uh, what we did is we looked at if we let them do reinforcement learning search. So it's a UCT search. Um, we found basically you had a noticeable hit in move prediction accuracy. So they're playing stronger. They, they will play a better game of chess, but they're basically finding these lines and making these moves that aren't very human. Additionally, uh, the models take as input this uh, history of uh, the past few games, or the last, the, sorry, the past uh, few moves that both players made. And if we remove that from them, so we just give them the current board, they also get a small uh, hit to their performance. Uh, so this is actually a bit of a handicap for our models 
as it makes them not perform very well as a sort of standalone. And uh, we're currently working on improving this as this is sort of a detriment of using our models uh, that something like Stockfish does not have, although Lila does. Um, <laughs> um, and then sort of what do we do with this? So uh, the last sort of question we had is why are they making these, how, where are these predictions changing from uh, Lila? So what do the boards look like that Maya gets cracked that Lila doesn't? And this very interesting result we got is basically our models make mistakes or what Stockfish would call mistake a lot more frequently than the other models. So in this plot on the far right uh, at zero is uh, humans making the moves that Stockfish says they should make. And then the further to the left you get, the worse their move is as decided by Stockfish. Um, so it's a bit of a weird uh, value because a uh, negative 0.1 means the human reduced their probability of winning by 10% when they made their move. So negative 0.3 means they dropped their probability of winning by 30%, which is basically, it's basically just losing the game. Um, and you can see, even when the human is doing something incredibly bad, an incredibly bad move, our models will with about 20% of the time, 25% of the time, predict that. So there is some set of even very weak moves that are sort of characterized and the model can find and uh, understand. And we think that sort of suggests that the models are doing something to understand human play. Um, and then that sort of leads to our sort of general goal, again, of uh, we're hoping this can sort of make an algorithmic teacher um, sort of find if we look at your games or you look at your play style, can we say what level you're at? What are the moves? What are the mistakes you're making that are common to someone of your level versus what are the mistakes you're making because you're hungry or distracted or whatever? Uh, what are the, what are the things that someone of your level can do to improve uh, directly? Um, towards a sort of algorithmic teacher that will also hopefully sort of, again, bridge this gap between AI systems and humans. Um, and we, we're just sort of starting on this sort of more sort of general goal of sort of bridging this gap. And uh, one of the first things we did is trying to look at where the sort of decision boundary is. So if you look at a chessboard, uh, this one here, uh, the move that the human made was uh, this uh, B5 to B6. Um, and it's not that good of a move. Um, Stockfish thinks they should take the pawn, uh, basically the, the uh, b5 uh, to a6 move on uh, the red and blue arrows. But we can see that our models, the, the, some of our models, uh, believe that this is the move someone would make. So we can sort of say that on this position, um, the human-like move uh, for someone at low skill is this, is this move here whereas the more correct move is only something that someone at a certain high level would make. Um, if you want to take a look at some more of these positions, we have online a version of this. I'm just gonna post it in the chat now. Um, so we have an interactive way of uh, viewing these. If you hit this explore more boards, uh, you can view a whole bunch of them and take a look at these sort of different decision boundaries. Um, so we're, that's sort of one of the things we've been working on right now is trying to sort of expand these tools and uh, find some ways of getting better human understanding and interaction with them. Um, so, uh, da -da. yeah, uh, just uh, I think that's sort of an interesting way of doing this. And again, we're sort of working on this right now. So if you have feedback about this, I'd be interested to hear. Um, and then, uh, one of the things that sort of happened more recently is in addition to trying to sort of understand these bots through these sort of analytic uh, uh, visualization techniques, we've also put these bots on WeChess, which have had these amazing reception. We were not expecting this when we put them up. Uh, we technically put them up in uh, January of 2019 or of uh, 2020, but we only really announced them and uh, they 
when we first put them up, their profiles were ambiguous and just said, this is a project uh, to play like humans, and never actually really explained anything. So in December of uh, last year, we actually sort of tried to publicize and put out a blog post on Microsoft Research Blog and also set up a website to sort of talk about this. And uh, the community on LeechS basically immediately uh, took a lot of interest. And since then, uh, the Maya 1, which is the one that's playing like 1100, trying to play like an 1100 rating player, has played over well over 100,000 games on LeechS. Um, and so one of the sort of nice things about this is now we sort of have a very good idea of what its rating is. And it sort of helped us solidify this idea that our models, so all these models, they're not actually playing exactly like a player of the target rating. They're playing like a committee of players of that rating. So it's very noticeable on the Maya, on the Maya 1 as its rating on Lee Chess is closer to 14 or 1500, depending on the time control, because it doesn't make as many mistakes as humans. So if we go back to this plot here, you can see we're only predicting about 25% of these really horrible blunders, maybe 50% of the, of the weaker ones. And when it's not making these mistakes, we can sort of see that it's still playing somewhat human-like, um, but it is still not making as many mistakes as someone of that rating level. So we can think of this as basically 10 1100 rated players all sort of sitting together and trying to pick up the next move. Um, and yeah, we got this wonderful uh, community engagement. Um, these uh, YouTube videos, Agonometer, who uh, uh, was instrumental in sort of getting us the early attention. Um, uh, and then more recently, uh, Lee Chess uh, released a blog post about our work. And uh, I just thought it was interesting. Uh, this plot on the bottom right, uh, you can see on the 17th, uh, Lee Chess made their blog post. And the number of moves our bots were making uh, very quickly jumped and has still and has maintained this sort of high height ever since. Um, we even, uh, Kasparov uh, likes what we're doing. So we're very happy with that. Um, and again, we got some, we got a little bit of press coverage, uh, this uh, Lee Chess blog post. Um, so it's been pretty wonderful. Um, sort of just in uh, summary, um, uh, yeah, we have these uh, human like neural chess engines uh, that are trying to capture not just human style, but human style at a specific chess level, at a specific level. And if you want to play them, you can play them right now on the chess. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, thanks for this. Um, again, if you want more information, go to myhs.com. And we also have this paper published uh, in uh, KDD 2020. It's available free online. Uh, if you go to our website, there's links to it. Uh, but here's also the link. Um, so uh, I still got a little bit of time. So before we go to questions, I'm just going to go over some of these uh, chess problems uh, that uh, I think was posted on the Facebook a little while ago, um, because there's some interesting uh, things. Uh, so we have these uh, chess problems. Uh, here is the study. Um, uh, ta -ta. So I think the original study was just published uh, that didn't have the moves. And I ran our models through these. And I found basically every single time our models were unable to come up with uh, the, crop, the strong move. Uh, so here, uh, if we look at dogfish, really accurately uh, predict um, that you make this queen move and uh, then it's mate. But our models like the uh, much more sort of defensive move of just sort of taking the simple capture, um, which isn't optimal. So sort of interesting that um, <laughs> even at sort of uh, a relatively simple position, they still are sort of biased towards making these uh, less aggressive plays. And I actually ran through all, all of these puzzles and every single one of them, the models just make these like boring uh, defensive plays that are, uh, I don't know, they're, they're human, 
they're they're a little bit dumb though. Um, yeah, even in stronger ones. The one so I'm showing here. This is the only one that the the stronger Maya is disagreed by a lot. Um, so the weaker ones made this move, whereas the stronger ones uh, made this one. They're basic. They're not. Neither of them is the correct move, uh, which is that. And yeah. So um, again, I don't know if this is. This is this is something that if we let them do the tree search, they would definitely be able to solve these puzzles uh, without much effort. Uh, but part of this is the models are still sort of limited to looking into the near future. Um, so yeah, I'm just reading this uh, question. Uh, uh, yeah, so basically, part of it is the models uh, are by design; they're not able to look too far into the future. And additionally, this is they're sort of just doing pattern matching. So if they've never seen this exact position, they're going to be able to uh, more sort of match on these sort of moves based on the patterns of play, not as much on the uh, exact specifics of winning. Because that's sort of one of the, the things about sort of deep learning is that um, we don't really have a good way of understanding and adding to these models uh, a way of act. They don't actually know how to play the game. They're just trying to imitate what they've seen before. Um, yeah. So, yeah, this is sort of an interesting result, uh, if a little boring. Um, yeah. So, just sort of getting to, uh, I was told there was a couple of questions that had already been submitted. I'm just going to have a sip of water. Um, yeah, so I think uh, the the question, uh, how do we learn from games played by Maya and Jin to become a better player? And as I said, we're sort of working on that. Uh, you can play against them. It's good. We, we've seen a couple of people on the chess have already sort of been using the bots to like practice end games or practice from specific position. Um, but we're hoping in the next, uh, in the moderate to near future to have sort of a better answer than that. Um, the, the next question we got was, what is the pre-processing steps for the data sets used on the chess engines? I went over a little bit of that. Um, but yeah, basically we remove games, uh, where there's low time. So we remove, uh, games that take less than a minute. And then we also removed, uh, during play, if either player had less than 30 seconds on their clock, we stopped the game there basically as a way of sort of reducing the probability of just see random moves because people are low on time. Um, then during the actual sort of uh, training of the models, we had to put them into this protobuffer format that's uh, basically just a whole bunch of zeros in this big matrix. So we take this little tiny text file that represents a game and it turns into uh, many gigabytes of just like ugly uh, but very fast to load files. Um, the full source code to train them yourself is available uh, on our GitHub repo, which is just linked on myhs.com. Um, additionally, we have all, all the source code, all the models are available. So if you want to play them yourself locally, you can. Uh, they just use the Leela uh, binaries. So you have to do a little bit of fiddling and work uh, to make them to sort of disable these tree search. Um, so then, yeah, possible uh, future modifications, possible of the MyHS engine. Uh, so there's a lot of things. Uh, sort of the stuff we've been currently working on is uh, trying to make them more personalized. So take a model, instead of trying to play like the average 1100 player, play like a specific 11, 1100 player or a specific 1900 rate player. Uh, so we're hoping uh, at, to publish on that soon. Um, when we do, there is some ethical concerns about releasing these models because uh, the models we find are very specific to players. Um, so we're still trying to figure out exactly what are the ethics of creating a, a chess engine that plays like a very specific person. Additionally to that, uh, we're hoping to produce some updates for people playing on Lee Chess. Um, and the one we're sort of most interested in is trying to predict the next the amount of time a player will take. Because one of the things we found uh, running these Lee Chess bots is that people were very off-put by the, the bots taking an inhuman amount of time. 
So initially they would uh, take, they, they take almost no time to make a move. And we sort of added and tweaked uh, this uh, algorithm for basically making it take some amount of time, but right now it's not very good. And I'd like to do it in a more sort of formal way. Um, and then the sort of final question is, uh, can blockchain algorithms be used for designing chess engines? Um, sort of, there's sort of two answers to this. First of all, I, I don't think the ones that you're thinking of in these sort of uh, more contemporary like uh, Bitcoin, uh, cryptocurrency based uh, finance uh, blockchain algorithms will are work very well for algorithm for these sort of deep learning algorithms. Uh, we already have lots of problems where it's relatively expensive computationally to run these models compared to more traditional chess engines. So adding the other additional complications of uh, blockchains uh, really doesn't work that well. Um, and additionally, we don't really have any sort of concern, security concerns. Uh, the other answer though, is we use Git, uh, which is uh, a version control system and it's very common in machine learning, basically in all uh, uh, programming work. Uh, and it is technically a blockchain. Uh, it uses Merkle trees, which is uh, basically a precursor to the sort of blockchains that were used on uh, on Bitcoin and are used in these more cryptocurrency ones. So technically, yes, we use blockchain for this, but in reality, no. Um, yeah, so uh, I think there's a couple more questions in the chat. Um, I'm a little bit over on the time, but um, so I'll read through this uh, chat or if the moderators want to call it one specifically. Um, additionally, if you uh, have a question and are feeling up for it, I'd be happy, it'd be great if you could turn on your mic and give it yourself. Um, so, yeah, let's see. Uh, do some uh, uh, Why do you think we really hello, need a human like engine? Hey, uh, who's Hi. this? Yeah, this is Anj. So, I wanted oh. to ask you that uh, what kind of data set are you using? Are you using the game PGNs in order to? make the model learn yeah exactly um so the the data set is i can actually show you uh to uh the if you go to database.leechess.org um there is this download site where you can just download the pgns uh so we did some pre-processing and uh if you want to learn more about that uh you can go to the GitHub page and this has the full code for running on your cells. Um, as I said, it is relatively computationally intensive to train these. You need a GPU. All right. And uh, we, we 12 million games takes a lot of time and uh, to run. Uh, so I'm lucky we're working with Microsoft Research. So they've sort of provided support and computing resources. Um, yeah, does that make sense to you? Yes, yes, it does. Uh, like you are extracting from the PG and then you are using that for training, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, All right. So uh, we're basically converting the PGN into a sequences of uh, matrices of these image files. Um, so it causes a huge increase in the file size, uh, but they're much more efficient to load as sort of uh, when training, actually the speed at which we can read and process data is very important. Um, yeah. Uh, other questions? Uh, does anyone want to speak up or uh, should I just read from the chat? Uh, okay. So, my dear. Uh, oh. Hey. Uh, hi, this is Hirsch. I wanted to know that after compiling the data, what does exactly, how does Maya exactly predict that which one will be the most likely? Because if you take out 50,000 games, then do you look at the similarities of the games or do you look at the most common mistakes that players make? Yeah, that's, that's an interesting question. That's a good question. So uh, the, the short answer is we don't really know. So uh, we're using a deep learning. So on the bottom here is a visualization of the network. So each of these rectangles is basically a large matrix. And... Uh, they view, uh, they, they view some kind of convolutions, uh, but basically you can think of this as sort of an eye going into a brain. 
So it views the chessboard and then it applies a series of mathematical operations on them. And these mathematical operations are, uh, they're learned uh, by all this training data. And we use something called backpropagation, which uses some fancy calculus basically to modify these matrices. Um, and the best understanding is that it basically is sort of trying to take in the chessboard and then it's remembered what similar chessboards look like and then what the moves that were made on similar ones of those uh, and sort of looking at this sort of weird average. And it's just doing it in a very complicated and very uh, high dimensional way. Um, but we don't know exactly. These models, uh, deep learning is not very interpretable. It's hard to actually take one of these because there's millions of different numbers in this model and try and figure out exactly what it's doing. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Does that answer your question? Uh, I, I guess it doesn't really, but the answer is we don't know. Um, <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, uh, what was I reading? Uh, does anyone else have any questions? Uh, so many dip, uh, Deb, uh, why do you think we really need a human like engine? Any other applications except helping people to learn? That's a good question. Um, as I said at the beginning, uh, there is a lot of uh, concern over other uh, algorithmic things that are coming on uh, into the world. There's a lot of fear and sort of questions about other algorithmic processes that are being added. Most notably, uh, there's a bunch of stuff uh, in uh, policing of uh, using AI systems to sort of predict uh, how much uh, bail you should cost or if you'll commit crimes or whatever. And so while, so we're sort of interested in using chess to study these more complicated problems. Um, but additionally, there's lots of value, I think, in sort of understanding how humans learn and play. Um, so I, I actually, my master's is in social sciences. I'm based, I'm in many ways more of a sociologist than a computer scientist. And so I'm very interested in understanding how human thinking differs from artificial thinking and sort of better getting getting away a better way of quantifying that uh, is very useful um, even if it isn't necessarily to help with learning it would help both to improve how artificial systems work and just sort of to better understand human intelligence in general um, you know uh, let's see uh, uh, and Nash uh, will it learn as it plays new games? No. So the models, uh, they only uh, have these uh, 12 million games. There are al algorithms called online learning algorithms that theoretically could work. We haven't designed, we haven't implemented them. Um, and it, that would be a different research project entirely. Um, so uh, I'd like to do that, but it's probably not gonna happen as the utility in that is really low. And we're sort of more focused on uh, trying to just make the best one for some given data set. Um, yeah. Uh, but yeah, if you want to put together a research paper yourself, that'd be really interesting to see. And there's ways of doing it. Uh, Rajas, uh, can Maya be programmed to change the style of playing, like attacking or defending, based on the positions? Uh, no. Uh, we, we actually have. Uh, an issue with these bots in that our models are deterministic. So if you give them the same input, they will always give the same output, um, which leads, leads to, if you just play them naively, uh, it's actually pretty boring because if you make the same move, they'll make the same move back and people can have learned uh, in the end game, basically way of exploiting them. And this is a byproduct of the neural networks again is there's no, there's no noise in the neural networks and we don't have any way of sort of imposing on them decisions. We can get around this a little bit uh, by introducing opening books and, uh, or uh, we, 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 we were, we're looking into the models they actually output for a probability distribution over the moves. So in theory, we could sort of use the models to try and uh, say, here's a couple of option moves, options for moves. Um, but it's it's a little bit 
uh, sketchy doing that. So we're still trying to figure that out. Um, yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, Prinanesh. Uh, Prinanesh. Uh, what about DeepMind Alpha Zero? Which was playing better than Stockfish after a mere nine hours of self training? Yeah, that is true. It, uh, they were using the same algorithm that Leela uses. So uh, I had this little slide on the beginning. Uh, so Leela Chess is very much directly just they read the uh, the uh, stock the Alpha Zero paper and they implemented it themselves. Uh, they're not Google, so it takes them weeks to months uh, to train a new model, but the actual algorithm is the same. And what we have done is we have taken their neural network de design because uh, the Leela people have made a bunch of oops, small but important changes to how these neural networks work that are originally designed for looking at images and presenting and making them work in chess. Um, so we've taken that work to get a very strong neural network design. Um, but I'd love to test against AlphaZero itself, um, but uh, it isn't available publicly. So there's no way of using it or of saying what AlphaZero's accuracy is. We just have to rely on uh, the exact, on uh, Leela, which is probably by now stronger than AlphaZero was, uh, to be honest. But Google could very easily train a new one that'd be stronger still. Um, uh, Oh, uh, he's playing straight. Oh, what is um, oh, says Cam uh, from Anesh again? Uh, if I train Maya using a player's game, let's say Magnus, will it be able to play like him? Um, as I said, that's what we're trying to figure out right now. Um, currently, the answer is probably not, but. That's because we haven't been able to find enough games by Magnus. Uh, the work I've been using, we want about 30,000 chess games uh, by a player. And we want them all to be at a relatively similar level um, and similar time controls and stuff. Uh, we're sort of trying to reduce the variance. Um, so maybe in the future. Um, but again, we, we've sort of. Uh, been debating uh, the ethics of that sort of also. Magnus in particular, he actually has a company called Play Magnus that sells as a software package a chess engine that plays like him at different times and trajectories in his career. Um, yeah. So it would be a bit it would be a bit rude of us to release a model that is competing with his uh, finance is one of the things he uses to make money. Um, as this is uh, just university projects, so we're not trying to uh, hurt people. Uh, well, I actually had to fill out some ethics review forms uh, to do some of my research and uh, say I will behave ethically. Um, Sherlock, uh, does Maya update itself after every Grandmaster game? Uh, no, so we're just using normal players. So uh, we're using these, and we're using normal players on Lee Chess. Lee Chess has relatively weak rankings compared to FID LO ratings. So uh, rating of 1900s on Lee Chess is uh, much less than rating of 1900 on the FID scale. Um, uh, Shasawat, uh, Shasawat. Uh, trying to make an engine that wins games, doesn't it make more sense to base it on calculations rather than human intuition? Uh, I think that's up for debate. Um, what we've found so far is that using these neural network-based ones tend to perform better. Um, and if you consider that to be human intuition or uh, calculations, I don't know. So Stockfish, the original Stockfish, uh, used a bunch of heuristics, so a bunch of human intuitions. And then the Leela uses a bunch of calculations from self-play. Um, but Stockfish is much more computation efficient. Uh, on the same sort of CPU, uh, Stockfish will beat Leela. Leela just wins because it uses GPUs and uses some more complicated uh, technological methods. But more generally, we're trying to understand humans. Uh, so we're not actually 
if if we could, if I could just sit in a room and think about and understand how the human brain worked, that would be amazing. Uh, but I'm not that smart. So, um, yeah. Uh, okay, I think we're at time. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, thank you for uh, being here. Uh, it's uh, been wonderful to give this talk. Um, yeah, I sad I'm not in Bombay to do it, but uh, uh, this very cold day in uh, Ontario will have to do as a substitute for Mumbai. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much, Reed. Uh, it was great to have you, and uh, I'm sure everyone enjoyed it a lot. Both uh, the Facebook page and uh, the Zoom chat, uh, the Zoom link had participants who yeah. talk at high numbers. And yeah, it was uh, great having you. Um, yeah. I'm sure everyone enjoyed it. Um, and thank you, everyone who came for the talk. Uh, do follow Avahan. We have posted all the links. It was great having yeah. you. Are there any final words you want to say? To anyone um let me see i'm just i i let's see uh no thank you for oh great you just sent talks um <laughs> no I'm, I'm actually still very terrible at chess um uh that's actually one of the things uh i haven't really if you look at my profile in the chess it's basically just me losing to my bots a lot um i use can the bot win, beat me as a if the bot can beat me, I consider the, the bot to be, to be broken, um, is where I'm at. Um, yeah. And yeah, if you, if you want to learn anything about this, um, just look us up. Um, and if you want to get in contact or whatever, there's a email link that basically just goes to me. Um, yeah. Thank you for this. And thanks for organizing this. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah there's uh, oh, the GitHub. Uh, sure. Uh, my uh, chess. Uh, uh, let's do.